Yeah, so good morning, everybody. Uh, I've chosen to take, take a topic which we generally not discussed or in our discussions had too much in depth detail about. So I've just chosen to give an introduction to two topics in cognitive neurology. Idea primarily being as an introduction to those who are especially exam going. The references, references are fairly simple. Few of the original papers involved and a textbook of an examiner who may, who you have, whom you may have an external, as an external examiner. Um, so we'll start off with, and I mean, like I said, there are two talks. So I'll try to keep half an hour for each. It's almost the same amount of length. If there's any issues, difficulties, just raise your hand. You can probably add on a little. Mind you, this is not the more uh, comprehensive for the whole thing. It's just picking on few important areas, which you may get in your exams and in your discussions. Okay, so to start off with functional uh, brain networks, what is a network in the brain? It's a neuronal circuit <clears throat> that connects functionally related brain areas. Primarily has a, a concept and a model where there's a node, a edge and a hub. So what is a node? It is a predefined collection of brain tissue. So every single, these are all single nodes, which are collection of tissues which, has, which have the same function. Nodes are connected to each other with uh, something referred to as edge. And many, if there is a single node, as you can see, there are some which are, this is of course, this is a schematic diagram where it's either connected to one or two or a few. Now, if there is a particular node which are connected to multiple other nodes or many other functions for that, that's what is referred to as a hub. Uh, so as you can see, these are, and this collection, one particular collections are called modules. So you can see four different modules here, but each of them have nodes, have edges connecting the nodes and nodes uh, between the modules are the hubs which are connecting each other. So structural and functional brain connectivity uh, by imaging is done by both the diffusion tensor imaging and a functional MRI. Now we're talking about, like I mentioned, it's not a comprehensive about all the networks, but few main networks that we would like to talk about. So three core brain networks is the default mode network, salience network and central executive network. I'm sure you've heard of all these. So we'll talk about a little, uh, each of them in a little detail. So central role of all these is coordinating cognition, effective and interpersonal processing. Now during cognitive, there's a simple introduction uh, to the, all three of them. During cognitive tasks, what happens? The executive network and the salience network increase in activation. Whereas the so-called DM or the de default mode network decrease in activation. So what is a default mode network? Now the primary, the first observations about this, that a particular part of the cortex would decrease in activity uh, during goal-directed events was made by Shulman 1997, not very, very far off. The name itself, DMN, was <coughs> made by Marcus Reichel in 2001 in, his, in the uh, paper that he had presented uh, as an inaugural paper. Uh, there's a decrease in their activity during novel or attention demanding tasks compared to a relaxed non-task states where it is actually active. Uh, and it is situated, the structurally it is in, involving the medial prefrontal, the temporal, both medial and lateral, and the parietal cortices, both medial and lateral. It's discrete, bilateral, and symmetric involvement of the cortical areas. Now these are schematic diagrams. The medial cortical areas involved are part of the DMN is, I'm sorry, I don't have a better pointer than, okay, yeah. So it involves the dorsal medial prefrontal, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the posterior cingulate with the adjacent preconius, and the medial temporal areas. Now mind you, there are two, two schematic diagrams of the brain which will be shown in this lecture. Where you see this is the medial aspect and where you see Without this is the lateral aspect, simple schematic. So, and the medial temporal areas also, part of the medial uh, uh, areas that are in part of the DMN is the hippocampus, the parahippocampus and the entorhinal cortex. Now, what are the lateral areas, both temporal and parietal? The temporal is primarily the temporal parietal junction, the lateral temporal cortex and the temporal pole. And the parietal is the area 39, approximately the area 39, or the angular gyrus. Now, the three most important among these, all of the lateral and the medial ones I've mentioned, functionally is the ventral, ventromedial prefrontal, dorsomedial prefrontal, and the posterior cingulate uh, cortex with the adjacent preconics. 
all of them mind you were in the medial uh, structures which were part of the dmn now ventromedial prefrontal cortex it acts as a sensory visceromotor link meaning that it receives sensory information from the external world of body via the orbitofrontal cortex and conveys this information to the limbic structures or the hypothalamus the amygdala and the periaqueductal gray matter the midbrain <clears throat> this is primarily concerned with the social behavior and mood control of uh, subjects dorsomedial prefrontal cortex is more concerned with the self referential mental activity self referencing meaning the participant or the subject having a sense of self and also <coughs> understanding that one is uniquely different from the others so dmn also is classified into subtypes two subtypes mainly that is the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex sub subtype or the subsystem and the medial temporal lobe sub subsystem now what are the structures what are the structures mainly uh, as part of the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex subsystem it's the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex and the lateral structures of the temporal lobe mainly the temporoparietal junction lateral temporal cortex and the temporal lobe the medial temporal lobe structures of the subsystem involves mainly the ventromedial prefrontal the medial temporal structures and the area 39 now both from both aspects it converges into a core system primarily within the uh, posterior cingulate cortex so that's what i just mm -hmm. mentioned now what is the difference they have two different distinct functions the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex is active when they are when people are actually considering the present states <coughs> most of you sitting here with my, now we thinking what life is like now <coughs> other than the lecture sir whereas the medial temporal lobe structures are more so active in uh, instances where they are people are thinking about the future they dreaming as part of it but all these when people are thinking about the futuristic aspects the core system uh, involves both the functions uh, of the above two now it is the dorsomedial the default mode network is involved in social cognitive processing and among the two subsystems the first one the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex is involved in understanding mental states of others which is referred to the theory of mind which we'll talk about and medial temporal lobe subsystem is more so than the understanding of the previous one this is more so involved in the emotional engagement in the social interactions now what is the salience the second network the salience network the our system the cns is or the nervous system is continuously bombarded with lot of stimuli both inter interpersonal or extrapersonal now our the the job of this network or we need a network to prioritize what should be attended to and what not so this system can integrate a highly processed sensory data along with the feedback or the visceral or the autonomic responses so the organism can decide what to do or not to do that decision making and the salience network is involved in the orientation of attention to the most hemodynamic hemostatically significant or salient events so the job of this primarily is an orientation to the what is required the anatomical substrate to this is the anterior insula and the anterior cingulate cortex now functions is to detect what is the most important or the salient event and once detected switching between the networks or the blaskill networks where a salient event is when a salient event is detected and among the two uh, two that i showed the interaction of the anterior and posterior insula to modulate autonomic reactivity to salient stimuli and also the coupling the functional coupling between the anterior insula and the anterior cingulate cortex facilitates rapid access to the motor system the third the central executive or the control network is an executive a uh, network which switches on when the hemostatically hemostatically relevant stimulus is identified by the salient network or the salience network and then it focuses so once oriented it focuses attention to the pertinent stimuli maintains relevant data in the working memory and appropriate actions are selected now what are the key components of this is the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the posterior parietal cortex <laughs> the salient network initiates the salient network initiates 
the dynamic switch process between the two other networks. Uh, how the sensory and the limbic inputs are processed by the anterior insula, which detects salient events, and then results in shifting from the default mode to the executive mode uh, with appropriate behavior when a stimulus is detected. So this is the dynamic switch model where you have the salient network ready to detect any uh, stimulus, whether sensory or limbic. If it is present, it changes uh, this dynamic switch between a default mode network, which is at rest. At rest, it is self-referential and endogenous mental activity. But once it detects a stimuli, it goes into the, it switches into the central executive network, where it is an exogenous stimuli requiring a cognitive or demand, cognitively demanding uh, prospect. Now, other than those three main which you discussed, we'll uh, talk about an attentional control network. Attention is an ability to focus mental processing to one uh, external or internal stimulus. And like I said before, the, mi the mind is continuously bombarded by stimuli. And among them, only one is kept in the focus of consciousness to the exclusion of others. Now, the mental ability to select this particular stimuli or response that are relevant among host of others which are irrelevant is attention. In other words, it is the ability to select information relevant to the current task and filtering out the rest. What are the three? There are three uh, attentional control systems, the alerting, the orienting, and the executive or supervisory network. Whether these are hierarchical, sequential, or simultaneous, we are not sure yet, but these are the three ones which we talk about, the alerting, orienting, and executive. The alerting network, what does it do? It, it, main, uh, it helps in achieving and maintaining an alert state in preparation for perceiving a following stimulus. Alerting is a change, cause a change in the internal state, and it is a very foundational form of attention on which the other attentional functions rest. It is different from arousal in the sense, arousal is a general non-specific excitability in unwanted situations, whereas alerting is a task-specific and goal-directed preparedness. So the alert state is critical for optimal performance of the higher cognitive functions. What is the anatomical and neurochemical sub substrates in this? Anatomically, it's involving the right frontal and parietal cortices. A lesion in the right frontal could cause impairment ability to sustain attention voluntarily, and a right parietal lesion might cause an impairment in maintaining this alert state and even orienting. A lesion in both of them together would reduce the ability to maintain the alertness and may also cause a profound neglect in the visual fields, opposite, or visual field opposite to the lesion. The Neurochemical substrate, it is regulated by the neuroepinephrine system, which is from the locus cerulis in the midbrain. What about the orienting network? It is the ability to select specific information from among multiple sensory stimuli. And these are uh, two types. Usually, I mean, typically examples uh, involve head and eye movement towards a particular target, usually in a reflexive ma manner. So what is reflexive? It is a sudden event which directs the attention to its location. A loud sound, you immediately turn there. Whereas a voluntary one is where you search for a visual field. I mean, search the visual field for a particular target. And how does it help? It enhances the performance by increasing the neural activity in a given sensory system. Example, you're orienting a particular type of target to a face or aspect of the target like color. And this results in amplification in that particular area in the brain. For example, the fusiform face area, once you detect a face or a visual area for the color detection and identification. The substrates here, the network is has both a dorsal circuit and a ventral circuit. The dorsal circuit involving the frontal eye fields and the intraparietal sulcus and the or the uh, superior parietal lobe, which help to orient the head and eye movements towards the target. The ventral circuit involves the, T, the temporoparietal junction and the frontal cortex. It helps in both breaking the focus of attention that's already persisting and switching to a new target location. The, this system, this network is regulated by the cholinergic system uh, involving the basal forebrain and also the superior colliculus and pulmonary. Executive network, it helps in monitoring and resolving conflicts among responses. It both inhibits inappropriate responses and activates appropriate ones. The, this attention is always needed when correcting errors, overcoming habitual actions, planning or making decisions, or even uh, a new response that is required which is not previously learned. 
So a typical example, an auto automatic response of reading the written diagnosis in a case sheet is inhibited in a case discussion and verbalizing a modified one as for the case discussion is activated by the this particular attention as we always see in our case discussions, right? Okay. The executive network uh, consists of two, the anterior sing cingulate cortex, which monitors the conflict, and the lateral prefrontal cortex, which resolves the conflict. The, this network is regulated by the dopamine system, which is from the basal ganglia. Lastly, in this, what are the... So, again, uh, because we mentioned these three things, a simple example again. So between alerting, orienting, and uh, the executive. So in a story, for instance, we are sitting in a class or a typical classroom in the school where there's a break between the classes. So everyone's running out or already out chatting. You hear the headmaster steps or the somebody coming, the teacher coming in. You're all alerted to the sound. That's the alerting response. Once you've heard that sound, all of you, all of us, look to the where the sound is. That is the orienting, the reflexive orienting, orienting uh, network. That's the function. And then what happens to me? So you, you hear and you're oriented and now you know the sound, the sound is very close. So now you run back to class, instead of going up to your own seat, you modify your ideas and get the immediate seat that you find. That is the modification that you have in the executive attention. Last bit here, what are the different types of attention that, that you're classified? The sustained attention or concentration is an ability to focus on one task without being distracted. Like all of you so nicely listen to a lecture, that is a concentration. Second is a selective attention. It's the ability to focus on one activity in the midst of many other activities, like studying in a noisy classroom. If you're able to focus on it, that is a selective attention. Alternating attention is able to alternate back and forth between two particular tasks like reading the cookbook, making the meal, Re reading the cookbook, making it, okay? And the last one is multitasking or divided attention, which again, all our registrars are so beautifully att attuned to. The ability to process two or more responses simultaneously, talking on the phone, giving the nurse orders, and typing the discharge summary. So that is a typical divided attention or multitasking. So in summary, we have the attentional control system, which is alerting, orienting, and executive, the anatomy and the anatomical substrate and the neurotransmitters involved. The alerting has a right frontal and parietal cortex. Transmitter is a noradrenaline. Orienting, the dorsal and ventral uh, structures involved. The transmitter is acetylcholine. And executive, which is in the anterior cingulate and lateral frontal, the transmitter being dopamine. That brings me to a close on the first topic. The second, so now we've reached half, half time, so half the topic, I guess, so the social cognition, social cognition is the second topic I wanted to introduce. What is social cognition? It's a cognitive process which focuses on how people perceive, understand, store and apply social information about other people or social situations. It's a developmental milestone right from childhood. In the early years, the children are egocentric. They know about themselves. They, they do things with respect to themselves. But as they grow older, they become aware not only of their own feelings, thoughts, or motives, but also of the emotions and mental states of others. Now, what is the impairment causing? It impairs the ability to form and sustain interpersonal relationships, impairment in social behavior, emotional perception, and understanding the feelings of others. This could be associated with both developmental or acquired problems. Developmental, like autism spectrum disorder, RETS, neurogenerative, like an FTD or Alzheimer's, neuropsychiatric illnesses, like schizophrenia or bipolar, or even neurotrauma, like classical example of the first studied case, is Phineas Gage. Now, why is social cognition so important? Because even DSM-5 criteria for dementia, this is one of the six neurocognitive domains that is uh, to be classified. Again, what is the neural basis of this? We already mentioned this, the nodes and the networks involvement. And what are the areas that we're finding on the MRI with respect or with respect to social cognition? So these, this list I'll be just explaining in the next few slides. So we classify into four key domains, the theory of mind, the affective and empathy, social perception, 
and social behavior. So what is the theory of mind? <clears throat> it's an ability to understand that others have beliefs, desires, perspectives, emotions, different from your own or one's own. Ability to make inferences about others' mental states. There are two types, generally, the cognitive and the affective theory of mind. The cognitive is the ability to understand the other person's cognitive states, whereas the affective is to understand the emotions involved in the same. Neural basis, for there are two uh, areas involved, the temporoparietal junction and the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex. The temporoparietal junction functions at a perceptual level, while the dorsomedial, uh, dorsomedial frontal prefrontal cortex is at a cognitive level. Now, what is the TPJ function? It involves, identifies goals and intentions of other persons or the, of another person's behavior. Classically, it is more so of the uh, left, associated with the left, but there are studies right now coming up, I mean, involving the right showing up that it, it is activated on the imaging in the right side as well. The dorsomedial prefrontal cortex integrates social information. What are the symptoms when there is a defect or a deficit in this, in this area? Uh, the person may have rude or offensive comments without, being, without, without having the regard for the feeling of others, inability to share in others' emotions, prejudicial, uh, prejudicial behavior, like not liking somebody in, of, of a particular religion or things like that, racist behavior or poor conversational turn-taking, which is a social discipline. Also having low threshold for tolerance for other people's behavior. Now, how do you clinically assess? There are, there are a few tests to do it. One of the classical tests uses a four-part test. What is a four-part? It is a tactless act or a remark in a social circumstance. And when you're applying the test, you give a story to the, to the patient or the subject where they read a story or listen to a story, and then you ask them, what is the faux pas in this? For example, a story here, Michelle wore a bright new dress for her birthday and her friend who was invited came and come in front of, front of everybody saying that it looks too bright and too ugly. Now, the questions what you would address, did someone say something they shouldn't have in this scenario? And if you think so, what was that? Or why did they say it? And things like that. So that's what a faux pas test is for assessing the theory of mind. I think there are also pictures, you can use pictures as well for the same concept, but like I said, there's many tests. This is one of them. Affective empathy. This is experiencing or sharing an emotional experience of another person. Now, empathy, you have to distinguish from other concepts, related concepts like sympathy, the affective theory of mind, or social perception, all which involve understanding, but not experiencing or sharing the other state. Cognitive empathy is also the same as affective uh, theory of mind, which again is the ability to understand emotion, but not to share. Now, what is the neural base of this? Anterior insula and the cingulate cortex. The anterior insula is involved in affective aspects of empathy, whereas the cingulate cortex is involved in the cognitive aspects. Symptoms of defects or deficits, they, a, person sh a person shows total disregard or distress for somebody else's loss. Now, how do you clinically assess? You can show any emotionally intense photograph, uh, any that you consider appropriate. This is something that was a, that was a very famous photo taken in 1993 in the famine in Sudan, where a child is, it, it was named the struggling girl or the vulture and the little girl, simply because this is the famine stricken child and the vulture is actually sitting, waiting for either death or etc. Now, irrespective of what the meaning, the point is whether the person has or feels that empathy in seeing that or interpreting the photograph. Social perception. It is the ability to make accurate interpretations about other people from their physical appearance. Could be facial expressions or gestures or tone of voice. This ability to identify and interpret expressions, actions and intentions of other people is a cornerstone of social cognition. Now, five ma major areas involved. I mean, so I, I'll tell you about this just with the next slide. So you can divide these five main areas into two, either the face recognition or the body recognition system. So the first, the first three, amygdala, fusiform face area and the superior temporal sulcus area are involved in the facial recognition. And the last three are the same, the superior temporal sulcus again, 
the fusiform body and the extracite body area are involved in the body uh, recognition and expression recognitions. The fusiform, the face area, superior temple and the amygdala are for the perception of facial expression. The fusiform face area perceives the invariant aspects of a face. For example, the nose, the ears, which are all unique for each person. The superior temporal sulcus perceives the changeable aspects, like the direction of gaze, how they look, uh, how they usually gaze, the lip movements or the expressions on the face. And the amygdala interprets in the emotional states through those facial expressions. For the body, it's the extra striate body area, the fusiform body area and the superior temporal sulcus area which interprets the physical appearance and gestures of people. Now, these two, the extra stride body area and the fusiform body area are sensitive to the perception of human body or body parts, but not to face, which is the other ones that we just discussed. The right superior temporal <coughs> sulcus region can interpret actions and social intentions of biological motion. Now, what is a biological motion? It is a visual, visual perception of a living being performing a known or recognizable act or movement. For example, a dance. What are the symptoms if the social perception area is affected or the network is affected? It's a failure to recognize and respond to emotional cues and social cues. Emotional cues like facial expression or body language or even social cues like boredom and anger. Like most of you look bored, I'm still persisting with my lecture. So the failure to comprehend jokes or puns that are clear to most. That is another typical <coughs> symptom. Now, how do you clinically assess the perception? The Ekman face, which is a black and white photograph, photographs of six basic emotions, happiness, sadness, fear, anger, disgust, or surprised. So recognition of these help to know that if you're, if you're, if you're able to have facial expression recognition. The last is social behavior which is interactions among individuals normally within the society that is beneficial either to one or more of those individuals. The neural base of this is the orbitofrontal cortex. What does it do? This area is involved for acquisition of appropriate behaviors, inhibition of inappropriate behaviors, is based on reward contingencies, calculates risk reward ratio while selecting behaviors, and the activation of this activation in two parts, the medial part, cause pleasure, reinforcing the behavior, or the lateral part causing displeasure, inhibiting the particular behavior. Damage to these areas often lead to the typical inappropriate behaviors, which we see in all the many ne neurodegenerative illnesses that we know of. Symptoms, social withdrawal, limited eye contact, lacking social graces, the lack of adherence to social standards of dressing or conversation, the loss of etiquette in eating or bodily function, or the lack of social reciprocity. For example, you're going, going to a party invited by somebody and taking a gift along with you. So that is one, something that is a socially a reciprocation that is considered. Now, how do you, what is a clinical assessment? It's a Bicart's social impairment rating scale where they see the social norms like dressing and appearance, the cues, social cues like eye contact and understanding facial expressions social graces where if they can see if they can interact politely in the circumstance and also social withdrawal so in summary the four domains that we talked about the theory of mind affective empathy social perception and social behavior the anatomical areas or nodes associated for theory of mind is a temporoparietal junction dorsomedial prefrontal junction or cortex and the test involved is four part test the affective empathy involves the insula and the cingulate gyrus, the area. The test involved is the showing emotionally intense photographs to see if what the response is like. Social perception, like I told you, the five areas, and you test with the emotional expressions test or the Ekman's faces. And social behavior, the node being the orbitofrontal cortex, the test being Bicard's social uh, impairment rating scale. Thank you.